everybody. You are tuned into H Camp Sports Talk Live. We are here with Hopkinton Hillers varsity hockey head coach, Chris McPherson. Coach McPherson, how's everything going and uh, how's the team doing? Uh, things are going pretty well. Uh, you know, we had a little shutdown for a little bit there, but we're uh, back in action and looking forward to our first game in a couple weeks on Wednesday. Uh, the team's doing pretty well, two and one so far. Um, a good win, a tough loss, and a good win. So hopefully we're, we're trending more with the good wins. Absolutely. It was a great win uh, in your last game against uh, Westwood. And you had a good win in one of the games against uh, Norwood as well. Uh, but I thought after a tough 8-1 to loss against Norwood, it was, it was a great rebound win against a talented uh, Westwood team. Uh, can you talk about the uh, talent on the team this year? I know you lost some key pieces from last year's roster, but uh, I think this team is, has some great talent and uh, can certainly do some uh, good things for the rest of the season. Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, there's definitely been an adjustment period, you know, losing some, you know, some very, very talented players, you know, obviously uh, top score of all time. And, you know, I, I would say we probably had the best line in the state last year um, as far as, you know, division two and three with, uh, with that senior group there. But uh, some kids have definitely stepped up this year and some, a lot of kids have a lot of different roles, more expanded roles. And, you know, they They've, they've done a good job so far and we just need to, you know, the kids come to the rink every day, you know, working hard to get better. And, you know, you never know what, what's going to happen after a loss like that eight to one loss that we had there. And, um, you know, they turn the page the next day in practice and kids are ready to go in that next game. And I was very, very proud of that response. Like, like you said, that was a great response. It certainly was. Uh, now I know we had this little two week pause on the season, uh, but, Game should be happening this week. I can't, well, I can't imagine the team was able to practice too much. Did you give them any homework to do to get ready for the rest of the season? Yeah, they. I asked them to watch the Westwood film and uh, put, put some pointers out there, some things to look at specifically, uh, you know, just what we're doing on the four checks, um, you know, D zone coverage, things like that. Uh, how can we improve the power play? Also gave them some off-ice uh, off training to do put together a couple of workouts for them and um, we'll see today. Hopefully we'll come back in some good shape. You know, we're right back on the ice today. So we got to get a lot of touches and get those hands back together, get the feet going again and also work teams, you know, the, the team concept work in the second half of the practice because we'll be right down in Medfield in two days. So it's going to come pretty quick. So a lot of reps today. And again, uh, you know, pretty much split it up with a lot of teamwork too. So. Any thoughts on uh, this Medfield team heading into a couple contests with them? Oh, they're always strong. I mean, ever since I've started, they've always been on the top Division two teams in the state. Uh, we always battle with them. Uh, you know, my first couple of years, they pounded us pretty good. But, you know, since then, we've, we've been able to hang with them and had some good wins against them. Uh, I don't see that, you know, th th their level of, of play uh, dropping from the past couple of years. They're going to be very hard to play against. And, you know, looking at this, some of the results recently, they've had some pretty good success after the, after the first week. So they're trending in the right direction. Yeah, there's certainly always a, a great uh, competitive team in the TVL. And, of course, they're in that Division One bracket, so they get a lot of the tough D1 teams. Uh, so with the COVID-19 protocols, uh, how has it been adjusting and uh, what has the hardest part been? I know there's not many rule changes and things like that, but uh, has anything been difficult to adjust to this season? Well, obviously, uh, lots and lots of different changes here, you know, having to keep in mind the kids have put the masks on, um, you know, the, the situation with the, with, with, with the benches is, is tough in games. You know, we, if one group comes off, we got to shuffle them all the way down. If they're not the next group up, then we got to have another group come on over and try to social distance on the benches. Um, been fairly difficult, um, but I thought we did a much better job with it last game. Hopefully that, that continues. As far as practices go, you know, we're trying to spread them out as much as we can. We're so used to all being, being in tight when we're going over, you know, drills on the board or going over uh, concepts like the four check and uh, you know, D zone, things like that, that we need to tr 
you need to spread them out a little bit more. Uh, so we have to talk louder, <laughs> but we have a mask on too, so we have to talk even louder. But um, no, I think that, um, not, like you said, not many rule changes. Um, that being said, we're doing the 22 and a half minute halves, which is definitely different than what we've done in the past close to three, three 50 minute periods. Um, you know, it seemed like that last game that we played, they, they, they blew the whistle on that scrum rule more than, than they, they had in the first two games. So I, I think it's, I think one thing that we're having a tough time adjusting to is, you know, it's just um, sometimes it seems like some, some officials will let more go. That's all. It's not a knock on the officials. I know they're, they're having a very difficult time trying to, uh, is, is that a scrum? Is that not a scrum? Is it, is that fourth person going into there? Or, and we did notice, like I said, last game that they were blowing the whistle a lot quicker than the first two games. So I guess it'll be the game situation to see how, how all that, that plays out. But I thought both teams adjusted to that relatively well last game uh, ourselves in Westwood. Yeah. I'd imagine it's uh, pretty difficult for the officials since the rules not really specific. It pretty much says break up a scrum. So it's kind of left up to interpretation. Um, but it seems like uh, the players are adjusting uh, to that well. And uh, I, I think as the season goes on, they'll continue adjusting to uh, all the COVID-19 uh, protocols well. But I'm curious, and I'd imagine this is a difficult part of it. How are the players adjusting to not being able to use the locker rooms? Yeah, no, it's definitely different. Uh, you know, they've come to the come into the rink already dressed, except for their their gloves, helmet, and skates. So, uh, um, you know, then they get in, and we they have to sit at you know every other seat uh, in, on benches just outside the the playing surface at the rink. And so it's been an adjustment, but they've done pretty well. They definitely have. Um, you know, still we still have to remind them sometimes. You know, you know, you're a little too close there. Move over a little bit, please. Um, but they've, they, they, they've, I, I feel like they've taken it seriously, which is making it easier for um, Coach O'Connor and myself. Has there been any changes in the way you have practices due to the COVID-19 situation? Any uh, changes uh, with what you have to do or pr procedure-wise? Um, you know, um, one thing that we have to do at, at the beginning of practice is just make sure we take attendance. Um, which is a little different in the past, uh, you know, just, you know, I guess for contact tracing, if anything did happen. Uh, but other than that, you know, we, once we, once we get, get through that, we're pretty much not many changes at all. You know, we get, we get our drills in, we do our, our skill work early, then do our team stuff second half. And, uh, you know, that, that has much been much of a change with that. Now we kind of have to try to separate them in the lines when we, when we do our, uh, some of our drills. So some drills might be a little bit higher in the zone to, enable some social distancing. That's been the toughest part, actually, I would say. It's just on the ice, trying to keep them socially distanced when they're not used to it. It's, it's just right. so, so different than anything they've ever had to do in their lives. Especially since it's a contact sport. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> uh, so against uh, Westwood, uh, Colin Norad was tremendous in net. Uh, can you talk about what it's been like to coach him uh, throughout his Hiller's career and how he has come along throughout his years in a Hiller's uniform? Uh, yeah, what a, what a nice, uh, what a nice story that is, uh, Colin. He, you know, last year, I, you know, I was looking ahead and saw that we didn't really have much in the pipeline for goaltenders. And uh, he was a JV player for two years as a forward. I played a little bit of D2. And uh, before the season started, I kind of identified him because he's a, strong lacrosse goaltender as someone that I just wanted to throw it out at him, he asked him if he wanted to play some goalie. And um, he, you know, he took the challenge, which I was you know, very happy that we, we definitely needed somebody coming into this year uh, as we only have two goaltenders in the whole system. And he's done a tremendous job. His improvement from last year, this year is remarkable, especially, you know, thinking about, you know, the shutdown last spring where, you know, I mean, I know that's his lacrosse time, but he couldn't really get in the ice to do like you know, any of the goalie clinics and things like that. Uh, but once he was able to get in the ice this fall, uh, he, I know he was doing it. I know our other goaltender, uh, Jack Lang, was also there with him um, do, doing a lot of the, the goalie clinics and things like that. And uh, just showed, just improved so much uh, compared to last year where he was. Obviously, it was his first time playing goalie last year. Um, but he's, uh, he's a nice little groove right now. And, uh, you know, really... Just really, really good teammate for everybody. Really hard worker, 
um, doesn't say much, but when he speaks, you know, people listen because, you know, he's one of those types of kids that, you know, you, you, you really want to listen to those kids that really like put the effort in and, you know, do the right things. And he, he's one of those kids. And, you know, he's going to be going to Springfield College next year to play lacrosse and uh, really, really happy for him that he got a new, his first choice. And uh, like I said, good success story for Colin, that's for sure. Yeah, he certainly is. Uh, is he liking playing goalie more than forward? I never really asked him that question, but <laughs> with the groove he's in right now, I, I certainly would think that he would be. He's got to be feeling pretty good about himself. He's uh, I think so. I think so. two, two and a half games, and he's only given up two goals against some, some really high-powered competition. So, uh, Yeah, he seems comfortable between the pipes. Uh, so uh, you got Pavit Mara and Joe Carazza in their sophomore seasons, and they have contributed heavily uh, so far this year, and I think those are two players to watch. Uh, going into the future years as well. Uh, can you talk about what it's been like to coach those guys and their contribution so far? Yeah. A couple of sophomores who, um, you know, are getting, you know, major minutes for us, you know, on power play penalty kill. Um, you know, we've, we've run two lines this year more than we have in the past. Typically we've run three, um, but you know, these kids have uh, shown that they can keep up with the stamina of, you know, going out there every other shift if we need them to. And, uh, you know, two good players. You know, Joe's a real tough kid. I know he's a football player, too. Um, and Pavit's a real, real skilled player. Um, and, they real, they, you know, they're friends. You can tell they complement each other really well. They seem to know each other's on where they, where they are on, on, on the ice. And uh, they really, really come to have a nice bond, you know, so far this season. That's for sure. Yeah, they've, they've been uh, terrific to watch this year. I see uh, a lot more contributions in future years for those two. Uh, so how has it been uh, scheduling-wise this year for practices and ice time and things like that? Has it been more difficult? Um, it hasn't been difficult, I think, because it, there's less there's less teams you know, practicing. Um, and then they still have seven rinks open up at, at the sports center. So we've been pretty much getting you know our normal ice times after school. Uh, so that really hasn't been a problem. Um, yeah, no, there, there really hasn't been any scheduling issues to date. I mean, we've had, we've had some where we had to flip-flop a few things. We've helped out, uh, I think, the girls' team. We had to, we got them a, a game. We gave them some ice for a game, then we're going to get some ice for a our, our, G, our JV team gave them some, some ice time. Or they gave up on Monday, but they're going to take a Thursday. So a uh, little, little bit of different scheduling there. But for the most part, the rink's been great. They've they're right on. Um, they have some new managers up there. Unfortunately, uh, the, the general manager for since the beginning uh, passed away this this past uh, fall, uh, West Tuttle. But the, the the people that have taken his place have done a great job, communication wise, and uh, you know, setting us up with our typical ice times. That's terrific. I'm glad to hear that because uh, I'm sure. Uh, well, I know for a fact in some other sports, it's certainly uh, been difficult. Uh, but fortunately, you have you play at a, um, a facility that has many ranks, so that's always a good thing. Uh, so it's been great to see the kids on the ice, but unfortunately, it is a shortened season this year. Um, are there any oppor- opponents not on your schedule this year that you're especially going to miss? I always like playing Medway. Um, you know, that's always a a really um, you know intense intense game that we we had with them. Uh, and we obviously back in back in the day, we always play them two times a year. Uh, we're down to one now that the Tri Valley Large and Small have split, but the, that's definitely one team that yeah we're, we're, we're missing seeing this year. They're, they're very strong squad too. Um, the the Martha's Vineyard tournament, you know, we've gone to that the past couple of years, so that's that that one's tough. That uh, that one's things a little bit more than some of the other ones because you know it's a good good getaway for the team. Uh, you know, we get to get away and. You know, Bond, you know, it's always a good bonding trip right before the playoffs start. Um, so I know that's one that the, that the players as well as other coaching staff is definitely going to miss this year. And then the Metro West Daily Cup, which is always right, um, right around the holidays there, you know, between Christmas and New Year's. Uh, that was obviously shut down this year, too. So uh, tough to miss that one, too. Uh, so Medway and the tournaments, that's those are the two big ones that you know, come to mind. Yeah, Med- Medway and Hopkinton's a- great rivalry in really any sport. 
Um, and it's funny because they say the same thing in basketball. When I, when I asked uh, some of the basketball captains and coaches, who are you going to miss this year? They say Medway. Uh, but who knows? Maybe you'll uh, end up adding them because I know some TVL large teams are filling a slot with perhaps a TVL small team. So maybe you'll see Medway this year. I guess uh, we'll have to wait and see what happens. Uh, but you got nine seniors on the roster this year who will certainly be missed. A lot of talent will be graduating after the season. But uh, how do you feel the future of Hiller's hockey is looking? I think there's some uh, great young players to look forward to. Yeah, it's a pretty deep uh, sophomore class. Um, you know, I think that they'll, you know, we'll, we'll be, you know, building around them the next couple of years. That's for sure. Uh you know, I, I feel like I have a pretty good beat on some of the uh, younger kids, you know, because I teach at Hopkins School. So I know all the kids that, that have come through. And I'm pretty sure the seventh grade class is pretty deep. Uh, I'm not sure about the eighth grade, but uh, I, but I definitely know seventh grade has got a lot of players. Uh, of course, you never know who's going to come. You know, you obviously cross your fingers that everyone comes, but that, that hasn't happened. Um, uh, we have had good success with keeping kids, but this, this freshman class this year um, – that there's a lot of talent that did not come. So we're hoping for the future that players do stick around. You know, we feel like we have a great product here. And um, I think we'll be fine as we move forward. Well, Coach, you've done a tremendous job with this program. They're always um, in the mix every single year in the tournament. We'll certainly miss the tournament this year. Uh, maybe not those long trips to the Cape, but <laughs> we'll certainly uh, miss the tournament. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? That's our second home that <laughs> Gallo is. down and born. <laughs> it is. And you guys have had a lot of success there. That's for sure. Uh, but we are looking forward to hopefully many more games to come in the future. And uh, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Well, Tom, thank you very much for having me. And, uh, you know, as usual, I, we, we really, not just myself, but all the athletics, uh, we really appreciate what, what HCAM does as far as, uh, you know, getting our games out there to the people, especially this year where, you know, our away team, teams that were playing from the road can't, can't even come to the games or anything like that. And you've, you've done a great service for everybody. So we really appreciate that. Just want to let you know that. Well, we love covering uh, sports and, and especially uh, hockey. It's always a great time. And uh, it's our pleasure to provide the games for the community. I can't imagine what it's like being a family member or a parent, not being able to go to the games Fortunately, they do allow some family members to go, but there are, we do know from the crowds that the Hillers usually get, there are many more people that would like to be there. So we are happy to do it. Great. Well, thanks again, Tom, for having me. I really appreciate it. And we'll thanks. see you Wednesday. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, Coach. And best of luck against Medfield. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and welcome back into HCAM Sports Talk. We hope you enjoyed our interview with Hopkinton Hillers boys hockey coach, Chris McPherson. Unfortunately, we just got word that Saturday's scheduled game against Medfield has been postponed. Uh, Medfield, they are going remote for the week, so they will not be having any games this week. So all kinds of changes in the Hillers broadcast schedule, of course, last night. Instead of playing Medfield, the girls' basketball team played Holliston. And we're not live right now, so we don't know the score. But <laughs> in any case, all kinds of changes going on. And unfortunately, that's just uh, one of the things you have to deal with nowadays, those late changes and uh, teams scrambling to try to fill dates. And there's still a possibility that the boys hockey team could play Saturday. They're currently looking for an opponent. So, hey, if there's any uh, high school hockey teams out there that want to play the Hillers, reach out to uh, Rich Cormier, the athletic director over in Hopkinton. Maybe uh, we got the ice time already. So come on down to the New England Sports Center and maybe we can get a game going for this Saturday. Maybe they'll take an a AAU team or something. We'll take something. We'll play anybody. Absolutely. But for this segment, I am joined by Mike Tarosian, of course. Jared Keen and Kevin Stone from the Metro West Daily News. And we got Andy Barron from My FM 1013. Guys, how is everybody doing out there? Doing good, Tom. Doing good. Doing good, Tom. Good to see you. Jared, did you get a nice tan out there in Florida? Uh, it wasn't really beach weather, actually. It, wasn't, uh, it was a little bit cooler than, uh, than, than I anticipated, but it was still, uh, still a solid trip. 
Oh, yeah. What are you going to tell us? It was really cold around 50 or 60. (laughs) Thanks. I would have rubbed it in. I would have been like, oh, it was beautiful weather. I was at the beach every day. It was 90 degrees, sunny, perfect. (laughs) Well, we do have some breaking news to start off the show. So here it is. Here it comes. Anytime now, Mike. Anytime. There we go. Uh, (laughs) Good effort. Good effort. (laughs) The Boston Athletic Association has announced that if road races can take place in Mass as part of the Massachusetts reopening plan, the 125th Boston Marathon will be held on Monday, October 11th. A virtual race option will also be offered in celebration of the 125th Boston Marathon. So Monday, October 11th is the intended date of this year's Boston Marathon. And like everything else nowadays, I'm sure it'll be a wait and see. But hopefully by Monday, October 11th, we'll be ready to have an event like the Boston Marathon. If, uh, But it's a worldwide event, so who knows if uh, this will end up happening. But I'll we do- should- well, okay. let's think, let's even go global. You know, the 2020 Olympics are supposed to start. And if, what was it? If, uh, if they don't, and if they don't start, was it April? Uh, what they give for the date? For the well, July, I think it's July, oh, July 23rd. They were supposed July, to start the Olympics. Right, July 23rd. And if it doesn't go, then boom, it's done. Did they postpone that already? Well, they, so yeah, they postponed it from last year. Now right. there was rumors going around that they're, that, Japan's ready to cancel the Olympics. There was a big article, I believe, in the Times, but I'm not really sure. Look, this this is just I we've talked about this on on uh, the this buzz a few times, gentlemen. How do you put an event like that on, really? And the Boston and, and getting to the Boston Marathon, Marty Walsh has said this is a, a world class event. Nobody will be excluded. So they're either going to have a full event or they're not going to have it at all. And right. You know what I mean? So it's like, I think it's great that they, they at least set a date, but it's 50, 50 at best. You just got to be right. realistic. Right. And you know, I think if anybody that could pull it off during COVID, it is the Boston athletic association. I've watched this race grow from living out here since 87 and being at the start and seeing how this race evolved. They, you know, they could take over the whole athletic center here at, Hopkins, you know, there's 13 fields. They choose two fields to put their village on. They could spread out the village. They could spread out the heats. They could do, you know, the gates and everything. I think if anyone that can pull it off, it is Boston. But, you know, what's the state going to allow? What's Walsh going to allow? What, you know, that's that's the big that's the big issue. And another, and sorry, and another issue is too. The Chicago Marathon is supposed to be taking place that weekend. The New York City Marathon is in three weeks after. So you're going to, and I think uh, London and Berlin also moved their marathons as well. You could be having six straight weeks of major marathons. I don't know how they can pull it off, but I agree with Michael. Yeah, I think they could pull it off, but man, it, it will look a lot different regardless because this right. is I, a I worldwide mean, event. I, I, I can see them putting up the gates in town and saying, that's it. No, nobody come in here. Just let your runners do your thing. Let your public safety come and do their thing yeah. and just let it go and make it virtual just like any other sporting event that we're watching right now on TV. Yeah, let's add some crowd noise. Let's add Let's add the uh, roaring tunnel there in Wellesley uh, when they go by on TV. You, you can make it work. Yeah, but it's a worldwide event. So, you know, you get a lot of runners from Kenya, obviously. You get a lot of runners from Europe. You get runners from all over the world. So I think the situation, it's – well, it's gonna ma- it's gonna depend on the situation around the world as far as the virus. You know, if well, there's a couple main countries that are still having bad outbreaks. Sure, I mean, of course, if you if know. you if you have if you have the COVID, they're not gonna let you travel. We get that, but the BA does a good job keeping these elite runners away from everybody as it is. You know, the, the elite men are here, elite women are here. So you're talking, you know, a dozen races here and there. In all different spots. I mean, they they could separate. They could do the distancing uh, the right way with the elite, and I think they could do it with everybody else. However, you know, it is a closed off course ever since uh, the the Boston Marathon bombing. 
you know, so they could make it even tighter. Just say, hey, no visitors, just go. Mike, that's right. a great point. Could it just be it's just runners only? You might have to wear a mask, no spectators. I mean, that's – you're going to have to get creative here too. It's not going to be just, oh, yeah, everyone's welcomed. No, there, it is going to have to be – this is going to be a fascinating thing really. And um, right. we're just going to – it's just going to have to wait and see. I mean, for everybody else, because obviously, you know, I haven't ran a marathon. Don't play it. I don't run to the bathroom, as everybody knows. <laughs> I don't – I but – it's a day for everybody else too. Everybody else wants to cheer it on. Everyone wants this to continue. It turned into a party. Hey guys, if you haven't led right now, no parties, you know, so what? Here's another thing. That's not a celebration, but these athletes here are training. They can run it. There's other events going on that they are running. You know, if they're not coming to Boston, they're going somewhere else. So I say, just do it. Separate. No so fans. Monday, October 11th, Boston Marathon. Mark it down. Well, at least we that's the intended date. We'll have to wait and see uh, what happens. It should certainly be interesting. And I have a feeling if it does happen, it'll probably be the highest rated TV ratings of all time for uh, this Boston Marathon because I think a lot of people will certainly be intrigued. Uh, but we have a couple of things to tell you about. Last reminder, registration is open for Hopkinton Little League Baseball and Softball. The deadline, January 31st. So if you haven't signed up your young one yet, do it uh, very soon. At Five Hopkinton, more days, people. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> at HopkintonLittleLeague.org. Just go click uh, register now to sign up for Hopkinton Little League Baseball or Softball. And this was our intended schedule. Um <laughs> This is no longer our schedule. <laughs> we, were, we, were, we were busy, Tom. We were we like, were. How, how are we going to do this? And we had all <laughs> what, this planning. What, what could have been. But yeah. anyways, that Tuesday, January 26th game, that's girls basketball versus Holliston. The girls hockey game on Wednesday, January 27th versus Norwood is still on. Alpine skiing as of right now. It could change at any moment, of course, but we hope it doesn't. Alpine, Alpine skiing is going to be at 7, 7 o'clock. Yes. And then Alpine skiing is uh, seven o'clock on Thursday, January 28th. So ignore that 615 time there. And Friday boys basketball that has been postponed as well. Again, Medfield shutting down for the week. They're going remote. So no sports for Medfield uh, boys basketball looking for an opponent for Friday, January 29th. So if there's any uh, boys basketball teams out there looking for an opponent for that day, uh, I'm sure Hopkinton would love to have you. And Saturday, January 30th, as we mentioned earlier, varsity boys hockey no longer on postponed as of right now, but the boys hockey team looking for an opponent for Saturday, January 30th. So if there's any hockey teams out there, uh, reach out to Rich Cormier and crew over at Hopkinton High School. Tom, you, Tom, you know what I went over at Dean? Maybe we'll get their teams over here to play. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be something. <laughs> Uh, well, so we uh, know who's going to the Super Bowl now. We had some great conference championships last week. Let's take a look at our Super Bowl picks and see how everyone's doing. Well, I'm sorry, Jared, but your Super oh, Bowl boy. pick is not <laughs> happening. I'm very much alive. I, I uh, courageously predicted the Super Bowl. <laughs> and guess what? Mike and Bob also got the uh, Super Bowl matchup, right? Kevin, wow. you still got your winner alive. And Andy, you still have your winner alive as well. So we're in pretty good shape, except for Jared. No. Except for Jared. <laughs> Poor guy. Of course. Of course. Uh, Tom, Tom, what happens if Bob and I win with Kansas City? Who's going to break the tie? What's, what, how's, well, how's Bob, it? since he predicted uh, the two teams yes, Bob, correctly. Bob, Bob, Bob has Bob. Okay. that tie. Yes. yes. Okay. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> And why do I have a, you know, I, I hope I'm wrong, but I just have a bad oh. feeling about Bob's prediction of Kansas City. I don't know. I guess we'll have to see. But anyways, there's two uh, really good games this past uh, Sunday. Well, really good for the most part. I mean, Buffalo didn't fare too well against Kansas City. Uh, but Tampa Bay getting the job done against Green Bay. And I'd say the most shocking thing to me about the whole weekend was, what was Green Bay thinking being down by eight points and going for a field goal with what, like 
two minutes and 15 seconds left, something like two that. Two and change. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. They go for a field goal to get down by five, which means they still need a touchdown. What they should have done, obviously, is went for the touchdown and a two-point conversion to tie the game. Uh, but that move was I, – I can't make sense of it. I, I just – can't even imagine being in that situation and not going for the touchdown. Uh, that was pretty shocking to me, guys. Yeah, not only that, for me, the biggest thing is right before halftime, Green Bay gets a stop and gets the ball back with two minutes to go and either two or three timeouts. Now, obviously, we know that Tampa Bay scored, but how they handled that possession, it just spoke volumes about – it was almost like Brady – was still on the Patriots. You know, the other coaching staff, they saw him and they still crapped their pants. It's unbelievable. Um, maybe it's been a Brady effect, you know, this whole time and and not so much Bill or, or Gillette Stadium. Well, if you look at, uh, and, I, and I like your point about the Brady effect, because look what has happened to the city of Tampa Bay lately. They had the Tampa Bay Lightning win the Stanley Cup. They had the Rays go to the World Series and, Almost beat the Dodgers. They gave him a run. And, of course, they got the Bucks going to the Super Bowl. So he's taken all of the Boston momentum uh, of being a championship city and literally brought it to Tampa <laughs> Bay. It's unbelievable. I, I am just impressed. And I don't know, Jared might expand on this now, just coming from Florida. But isn't it amazing how no one in Florida thinks Tom Brady's a cheater anymore? <laughs> Did you see a lot of Bucks jerseys down there in Florida, Jack? I did. I did. There was a lot of Bucks jerseys. Um, a lot of number 12s? Yeah, a lot yeah. of number 12s. Uh, the Bucks. Um, I still won't do it. I I'm pretty sure it's the highest-selling jer- jersey in, in the NFL right now. Or, I just want to I just want to piggyback on on Kevin's point. I think um, I, I, I agree with Kevin. I don't think that can be overlooked a single bit. Um, Green Bay obviously had a chance there right before the half. That was a huge opportunity uh, to score, best case scenario. And then again, yeah, just that Brady effect. And then it turns into the worst case scenario, giving up a touchdown, you know, 10 seconds before the half. How, I mean, how do you do that? Like what's, again, what's the other, only other logical explanation besides the Brady effect? Um, Green Bay played. I'm sorry. Sorry. Go for it, Andy. Go for it. Green Bay played they were scared they were you had were. you had home field advantage they had no at, reason to be either they had no reason to be exactly you played scared that was as soon as scotty miller caught that touchdown like this game's over and yep. i almost i almost i almost ate my words because green bay didn't make make another run back and tom brady, and brady threw three, three interceptions it was poor in the second so, half he was not the good thing about, the thing about the brady picks though if you look back on it None of them were actual, you know, game changers. I looked today. I think they happened at the Green Bay 32, the 24, and the 19 or something like that. Um, so they were basically just all long punts. Right. So, yeah, they were, they were ugly. But he never put them in a position where they, you know, they were really affected. Um, and, I, again, it just it felt like an old Patriots game. It really did. You know, the other point, I want, Kevin, I want to make, too, is – is that, okay, and what Tom said this too, Matt LaFleur needs to be held accountable too because I think he did a horrendous job coaching in this game. Horrendous. You took the ball out of Aaron Rodgers' hands. Mm-hmm. This guy is one of the best quarterbacks in the league. So what? They don't get it on fourth down. You pin Tom Brady back in the eight-yard line and, and the, the Green Bay defense was starting to play better. You punt the ball away, you give it your chances. I would have rather just have went for it, even if they didn't get it, Okay, you lost, but you lost with your best player. Aaron Rodgers has to be irate right now. Really, yeah. I'd have to and imagine. Even, you can see it afterwards too. He, you know he, yeah. you know he was uh, mad when he when he. Uh, I love his quote. It wasn't my decision. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. what I mean. It's what, it wasn't my decision. Yeah. <laughs> so many drop and, and, passes, penalties. Like, oh, Green Bay was horrible. They were horrible. <laughs> Go they ahead, were, Kevin. They were awful. Even the play calling down at the goal line, A.J. Dillon had some nice runs early in that game. Um, that's perfect A.J. Dillon weather. And they just kept throwing the ball. Like, yeah, right. I know you have Aaron Rodgers, but you need a few yards in a in a freezing cold weather game. Just hand the ball off to A.J. Dillon. 
Why didn't they utilize him more? The guy's a yeah. powerhouse. Aaron Jones, right. too. Agreed. Right. This was both, the, of the, both of those guys. Yeah. Well, wasn't Jones injured? Um, I, maybe I a little, on, but yeah. but I think you got if you're Green Bay, you got to start asking Matt Lafleur some questions. He's yeah. got one more shot because that was. In, I'm sorry, I'm not an NFL coach, but that was just inexcusable. Oh, it's, it certainly was. They just crumbled, and pretty much everything he ended up doing towards pretty much throughout the whole game, but especially towards the end of the game, I just couldn't believe it. Uh, I mean, you had third and what was it? Third and three, third and two. And you don't run the ball. You pass the ball and bring up that fourth down and go for the field goal to get within five. It, it um, made zero sense. On the flip side of this though, in terms of the, the goal line play calling, yeah, Green Bay's goal line play calling or, you know, red zone play calling was pretty awful, but I think you have to give credit to Tampa Bay's defense, uh, specifically the way they played Devontae Adams. You know, yeah. Rodgers obviously likes to get mm-hmm. Devontae Adams the ball in the, you know, in the red zone, you know, kind of these little kind of motion and then kind of get out, quick toss, boom, open right there. Re- uh, Tampa Bay was all over that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, they were. And yeah. there was only one slip up really with Adams when he had that long yeah. touchdown. But besides yeah. that, not so much. How about this, I can't believe I'm even saying this, <laughs> but if Mike McCarthy was still the coach there, do the Packers win that game? No. You no. still don't think so? God, no. no. Because it, I, might be, it might be worse. I mean, <laughs> only only yeah. if, Tampa, if Tampa made more mistakes, maybe, but. Uh, you don't think no. so? No. I no. just, because I don't know. I mean, he was there for a long time, obviously. Sure. But, man, that was just so, that was horrible. Well, if McCarthy's there, I don't even think they're in the playoffs. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, I still think they are. Aaron Rodgers runs that team. But here, yeah. and now I'm going to, does he come to the Patriots next year? Is there any chance? Oh, Aaron yeah. Rodgers. No, no, God, no. no. I'd love to see it. I'd take him in a heartbeat. Yeah. Uh, That'd I be think great. Right. Not gonna I think he's one of the best in the game for sure. Um, Aaron Rodgers or Deshaun Watson, those are my two uh, yeah. favorites to go to the Pats. But I don't know if they're going to do that. They obviously have a lot of cap room coming up. And uh, I don't know. The more I think about it, the more I think they're just going to go young because they do have a lot of slots to fill pretty much all over the field. And I think uh, you'll probably hear of possibly players like Hightower retiring and maybe a couple more retiring that didn't play this year. Um, I'm hoping, though, I think what they should do is just get right back into the mix and get a Rodgers or Watson, but I don't know if they're going to do that. Uh, I do think Rodgers wants out of Green Bay. I think he's very frustrated, especially after that. And the Green Bay kicking that field goal, that's kind of a slap in the face to Aaron Rodgers when you think about it, yep. because it's like, you know what? We got more faith in our defense than our offense, our Aaron Rodgers led offense. And let's not forget who Green Bay drafted with their first pick. They got a quarterback. So, you know, <laughs> I, I see so many hints of, hey, uh, we want you out of town, Aaron. So I think that was his last game as a Packer, in my opinion. So the crazy thing is, though, if you look at the, the market that Tom Brady had in the offseason, there was nothing there. And he's actually won six Super Bowls. Aaron Rodgers has won one. So what's the market like for him at however old he is? What, 37? Something like that. So that's going to be interesting to see, too. Oh, teams will be all over it. I mean, you know he's a good quarterback. He's, I think he put up the best stats in the league this year. I think there'll definitely be a market for him. And I think there's a pretty huge quarterback market this year. Looking at all the quarterbacks that want to leave their team. There's, you know, there's always going to be teams in the league that are going to be, you know, itching for quarterbacks, whether it's, you know, somebody that they want to get from the league or somebody that they want to draft. And I mean, you know, this year's draft, obviously there's going to be some quarterbacks that, you know, teams are going to want to take, but I mean, if a guy like Aaron Rodgers is out there, you know, teams are going to want to go after him regardless of his market, I think. There's about five quarterbacks that I'm going to name right now. It's Aaron Rodgers, Deshaun Watson, Matthew Stafford, Matt Ryan. Those those are the guys. It's time to make a splash. I'm ready to get back into the Knicks. Enough, okay? I think I think Deshaun Watson would be a perfect fit for the Pats. It's just a question of whether money. he money. whether whether yeah. he would go there. Money, yeah, you know, there's, a few different things. Yeah, there's no way he would ever come here, especially now with um, guys like Patricia on board. And I, I put yeah. Watson. Watson, Stafford, and Rodgers all in the same category for me. Yeah, they'd be awesome here, but 
but there's no chance in hell. Um, <laughs> I, I think the I think the most realistic guy is still Jimmy G. Uh, right. San Fran, uh, so for me, I think if Rogers goes anywhere, it's San Fran. He went to Cal. I think he's from California. Um, so that allows Jimmy G to break free and come here as well. So uh, I think that's just more realistic. And, and with Jimmy G, again, you're, I've said this, I don't know how many times now, you're not starting from scratch. He knows the system. And if you have guys around him, you're already hitting the ground running compared to what you would be if you go out and sign someone you don't know or right. you draft a kid. So he just seems the most realistic to me. Yeah, if you're asking me uh, to bet on who the, they're going to get, it would be Jimmy G for sure, just because I think Belichick always goes for the players uh, that know the system, that have an easier transition. And obviously uh, it would be a much easier transition uh, with Jimmy G. But if you're asking me who do I want the most, it's Deshaun Watson or Aaron Rodgers. But Definitely. realistically, yeah, absolutely. Jimmy. Definitely. Of course. Good question, but I just I just hope we don't up with, end up with Sam Darnold. Anybody but Sam Darnold. <laughs> I could also picture them doing that. Um, are you happy that Matt Patricia's back? Or no, no I mean... I'm not. I think he's worthless. <laughs> I think he's horrible. <laughs> That's too I, had, I, had, but, uh, I had I had to ask you that because I I couldn't. Why I is Matthew Stafford going to want to come here? That Matt Patricia's here. It's I not know gonna... exactly. Yeah, exactly. I have a feeling Patricia's role will hopefully his role will be very limited. And he won't be running the defense. I do not want to see that. Maybe he'll just be a linebacker coach or something, you know? Right. Well, they've, they've been saying he's going to work with the offense, which is mind-boggling. That's ridiculous. Give me a break. He's he's like, Come all right, on. I failed working with defenses, so I guess I'll try the offense. offenses Great. and see how. <laughs> and here's another question for you all, gentlemen. Uh, is Josh McDaniels done being a head coach in the NFL because the Philadelphia Eagles didn't even want him? That's a sign right there that – He's probably going to be here for a long time. Definitely. Yes. And I, I can't remember if I mentioned it on here or not, but um, Joe Murray from 98.5 had the best theory that I've ever heard. And that's, you know, Philly had Josh in for, I think it was either eight or 12 hours. And they were just wasting his time. Um, Cause when he bailed on Indy, they lost Frank Reich. Um, so that was kind of their, their petty little payback. And I absolutely love that idea. Um, I hope that's what happened. I can't imagine he gets another job or at least another no. offer at this point. I mean, um, eight to 12 hours and you don't get the job. Clearly it's there, that there's more there than him just not being qualified. Yeah. You know, I could see that too. It's like, we're going to get yeah. some revenge on this guy. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if the Colts, uh, when, if they're ever looking for a head coach, call him up, <laughs> do the same thing. Let's, <laughs> hey, yeah. Come in for an interview. Keep him there for like 12 hours, make him fly out yeah, there. He, nah, he, we're good. He's just he th- Kevin's right. There he is either not well liked by a lot of people, or they just how are they just like, how can we trust you after what you did to the Colts? And hey, look, the Colts, I think, made the right moves. I think Frank Reich's a pretty good coach. Obviously, yeah. they need a quarterback. They right had a now good too. year this year, the Colts. They almost yeah. beat the Bills. Right. They, yeah. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I know Rivers retired, but Jacoby Brissett's probably going to be their starter next year. Yep. Unless they go make a splash. But, you know, I I just – but, yeah, you have to think McDaniels is here now until probably Bill retires, which hopefully isn't anytime soon. But, I mean – The other thing that hurts him too is Brady having all the the success he's having without him. Um, McDaniels had a terrible year with Cam Newton, and now Brady's going off, you know, with Byron freaking Leftwich as his his coordinator – that can't be good for Josh McDaniels. I mean, I don't think it really matters who the coordinator is when you have Brady. Fair enough. It, it almost seemed to me like Brady, uh, especially towards the end of that season or maybe towards the middle, started running that offense. I mean, you see him looking at that wristband quite a bit. I think he's coming up with the plays they're going to call. Uh, and Byron's just kind of there to, to assist them. Um and it doesn't seem like Arians really has to do anything at all. He just kind of sits back and relaxes and watch Brady do his thing. But um, yeah, uh, the Bucks offense, I mean, it's unbelievable the weapons they got. And um, when you're thinking about this Super Bowl matchup, you got Tampa Bay, Kansas City, bet the over. <laughs> <laughs> 
I think there's going to be a lot of points in in this uh, upcoming Super Bowl matchup. Watch now, it's going to be like a fourteen to ten game. You know, yeah, you, I know. You think I that now it's going to be like well, it, it, it. You know, it really wouldn't surprise me because I think these defenses are both very underrated. I agree. And I do and, agree. He, and here's the the thing. I actually talked with Tom about this the other day, but can we agree that this is going to be Tom Brady's toughest matchup in the Super Bowl? This Chiefs team is a wagon. I mean, oh, yeah, really. Well, oh yeah. So offensively, yeah, that's the Seattle team in oh in, in fourteen. Oh no doubt and about it, Kevin. No, that defense I, is ridiculous. Oh, it's yeah, unbelievable. Offens- offensively on the other side, he's never had to match points for points like right. he's going to here. Yep. Can we safe to say that Patrick Mahomes, the play is never over with him until he's on the ground. I've never seen anybody like this guy. Mm-hmm. Really, he's just phenomenal. And how are you going to stop Tyree Kill and Travis Kelsey? Now, look, I'm not a Chiefs fan, but I'm just being realistic. I mean, these guys are almost uncoverable. I mean, really. And, especially and just, especially Tyree Kill. I mean, he guy is, guy is ridiculous. ridiculous. He's like a cheap They're the closest color. thing to the, to the 99 Rams that I think I've ever seen. It's unreal. <laughs> it's, Tyree it's Kill seems like he gets faster as the game goes on. Yeah. Like, that Bills uh, secondary is no joke. That is a very good secondary. And the Chiefs shredded them apart. Yep. Like, Holy what, Hill, had, Hill had what nine catches for 170 yards. Kelsey had two touchdowns. I mean, yeah. can we all agree that Kelsey is the best tight end in the league? No There's question no about it. No oh, doubt. definitely. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Without a doubt. The guy is um, outrageously good. Yeah. Um, I, I think, uh, though, if anything's going to stop Kansas City, it's going to be Tampa's pass rush. And they do have a yeah. pretty good pass rush, but it's so tough to bring down Mahomes. But exactly. They, they need know, to well, hit him, and they need to hit him hard. They, they need to do what the uh, Browns did. Just beat well, him that, up. That linebacker Smith, you can put him on Kelsey as well. Um, I don't know if anybody else really has that ability, you know, in the league to match up with Kelsey. So that could be huge too. That over under right now as well is fifty six, and that's two weeks out. Wow, that's going to go up. I think. Yeah, it, I'd it be should. shocked if it it didn't hit sixty. Does yeah. Tom does Tom Brady like if he does lose this game? I don't think it affects his legacy, but no. Does it, it no, doesn't not at no, all. No, no don't I don't know. think it does. But if I mean, obviously, if he wins, I mean, oh my goodness, it's just, I mean, it's just he's just piling it on. But here's the other thing, and I've said this before: if Patrick Mahomes wins this one, I think he's on his way because right now mm-hmm. he can really start separating himself from guys like Rogers and Breeze and Russell Wilson. Yeah. I think this is a really because I personally don't see anyone in the AFC that's even close to taking the Chiefs out. Really? Yeah, yeah I, I mean. Think- you thought Buffalo was going to give them a run because they have such a good defense. They're not close. They're not and close. they might be the yeah. best defense in the league. And Kansas City just torched them. It, it was unreal. I guess if anyone almost took them down, it was the Browns. Cleveland, yeah. And a large yeah. part of that was because yeah. Mahomes ended up getting hurt in that game. Uh, but I thought this was going to be a really close game. And I was pretty shocked at just how Kansas City was able to torch that defense. I was too. I mean, Kansas City must have known that I picked Buffalo to go to the Super Bowl. So, uh, <laughs> you know, they were like, "Yeah, uh, we're, we're going to eliminate Jared's picks." But yeah, seriously, I know. I mean, they, Kansas no, City, so Kansas City can go on a run like the Patriots did. I'm just being realistic here. I don't see anyone that's going to slow them down. Yeah, no, mm-hmm. that's what I was going to say. Is yeah, that's the scariest part about being a, Pan, a Pats fan and watching that game. You see just how far away they really are. Um, yeah, even to from, being on that level. Yeah, even from Buffalo. Like, even if they're playing Buffalo in that game, I don't know if they can hang with them. Um, granted, Kansas City's offense is just, you know, they're they're in a class by themselves, but the Pats are so far away from so many different teams in the AFC. Uh, it's it's a problem. Yep. Well, I tell you, the other, the other thing, too, that reason why I'm still going with Tampa and stuck with it from the start, first time a home team is going to play a Super Bowl at home, right? That's what. So I think that is going to be the the one thing that Brady will take that nobody will ever touch again, Mm -hmm. because what's the look? How long it took for a home team, you know, to play at home in a Super Bowl? What when's that ever going to happen again? Yeah, I don't. I don't think it will. This could be the only time it ever happens. Right. And who? And who wins the Super Bowl? this Super Bowl wasn't even supposed to be in Tampa initially, right? Wasn't it supposed to no, be? No, it was. In... Oh, it was? Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 They, picked up, they picked up about, what, two years ahead or something? Yeah. You know, th- there was something that said, when I saw the Super Bowl was in Tampa, I just, 
I'm like, you know, if anybody's going to end up playing a home game Super Bowl or a Super Bowl at their home stadium, it's going to be Tom Brady <laughs> because why not? <laughs> um, I'd imagine, though, as far as ticket sales, they're going to even it out. I think they'll make uh, an even amount of tickets available to Kansas City fans sure. as they will Tampa fans. Yeah, plus they have, what, 7,000 uh, uh, workers going there as well, uh, healthcare workers. I think right. from all over the country going as well. So the funny thing is, too, real quick, if Minnesota had beaten Philly back in 2017, the Pats would have been facing Minnesota at Minnesota. In, so in Minnesota. Actually, so that would have been nuts, too. But, uh, yeah, of course it's him. <laughs> 22,000 fans will be allowed into Raymond James Stadium. So, yeah, they'll, yeah. they'll even it out. And I believe you have to have a – I, I, if I read this correctly, I think you have to have a vaccine in order to go. Yeah. You have to wear a mask. I mean, yeah. it's very yeah. strict. I mean, it's not yep. just like, okay, let's it go ahead. Be, it oh, yeah, ab- absolutely. So, I'd like um, the rest of the state. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's... So, so here's the other thing. What, 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 what are your thoughts on this here about watching the Super Bowl? Granted, in, in Mass, yeah, in New England, everyone wants – I think everyone in New England is going to watch it because it's Tom Brady. But you know how when all your teams aren't in it, nobody cares, kind of thing. But now during COVID, and you if you noticed and you hear in the news the past couple of days, all the major sponsors, Coca-Cola, Budweiser, are not putting ads in, they're not buying the time. And I I just don't think that they're looking to uh see a big return in their investment because you know Budweiser spends the entire television budget on this one commercial for Super Bowl Sunday, and they're not even doing that. They're turning it elsewhere. So I'm feeling that television-wise, it's not going to be a big draw. I think it's going to be a huge I draw. I mean, yeah. the Super Bowl is always a huge draw. And by the way, the Are NFC. You- I just saw the NFC Championship game had the biggest TV audience since last year's Super Bowl. So, I'm not surprised. Yeah, obviously the Wisconsin. Brady effect, man. That's the Brady effect. Brady effect. Right. I think the other thing, too, is – there are people that cannot stand Tom Brady. Yep. Do you think they want to see him lose? We're going to watch the Super Bowl. Absolutely. Uh, th- this could be one of the big, because what else are people really going to do? Yeah, right. There's nothing I mean, else to do. I mean, you can't really, I mean, are people going to go to Super Bowl parties this year? Probably not. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just, this is a, this is a, a worldwide event. So, but I, I see what Michael's saying as far as the ads going and whatnot, but um, yeah, I just think people want to see this guy lose. Right. I, I just like just like anything else. I mean, I was watching soccer and golf because it was the first stuff televised, and I want to see you know more sports on TV. I've watched more college this year than I have in the past mm-hmm. three years, and but you know when when you hear about all the big sponsors not signing up uh, for time slots, you know are they thinking that it's not going to be well watched like it was last year, the year before? Maybe they just, the maybe they just think it looks bad, it. you know, because there's a, vi- a, vi- a pandemic going on. I don't know. I mean, it just use use your time to do something positive. They still, hey, we had 9 11 and they still uh, advertised. You know, and I'm just wondering too, like, if you think about it, and that was an interesting point about the Super Bowl parties, you won't see as many of those this year. But wouldn't that bring up the TV yeah. ratings? Because you'll have the Super Bowl on in more homes, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's so, like, I mean, in Kansas City, I think I saw 85% of TVs were on in Kansas City. So the, the other 15%, those people were probably just watching someone else's house. I mean, yeah. everybody's sitting at home and watching games. And and even if you don't have a team, you know, in it every year, someone's always going to pick, you know, a side to root for, whether you're betting, whether, you know, you have squares. So I think this year more than ever, people are either going to root for Brady or they're not. There's <laughs> right. no... There's no half ass watching this year. Either no. you pick a side or you don't. So I think that's going to help the ratings as well. Yeah, I think it'll be highly rated. And um, I think it'll be like the typical Super Bowl, one of the highest yeah. rated television events Just... in the country, in the world. I think it's going to hold up to its reputation. I think this is a very intriguing matchup. And uh, you think about it, you got Brady going to his 10th Super Bowl, his 10th. <laughs> I don't. I don't think we'll ever see somebody go to ten Super Bowls again. No. That is unbelievable. No. That's the most. No, unbelievable he might even go to. Huh? He might go to eleven or twelve if he signs an extension. 
Right. Yeah. And, well, he's playing next year, uh, most yeah. likely. I, I believe he already agreed to play that second year. So, I you know, know, if he goes next year, that's 11. And that would tie the New England Patriots, by the way, <laughs> who have 11 Super Bowl appearances. You know, here's well, one unless more. The, unless the Patriots are in it with him. Here's one more <laughs> quick point, too. Like, I really don't think the Patriots could have done anything to keep Tom Brady here. And here's no. why. He wanted to go. He he his, at his age now too. He want he's in a warm weather climate now. It's like this guy could play till he's fifty. Really, well, there's no, it's there's no way he's going back to a cold weather climate. No, 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 no. That. But 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 seriously, think about this. It would not shock me if this guy did play another five years, just because of the environment he's in. He's in a warm weather climate. He's going to very rarely have to play a cold weather game. Wouldn't shock me one bit at this point because it doesn't look like he's slowing down. Honestly, I agree yeah. with that, but I do think. There's two things that, that would have brought him back. We found out this past weekend that if they had gotten Stephon Diggs, that, that's a game changer for him. So that might have altered his, his thinking. Yeah. But for me, it's just all Belichick had to do was acknowledge that, yes, he is bigger than the team. Give him that extension. Acknowledge that someone can be bigger than the franchise, but not act like it. Tom Brady never acted like he was bigger than the franchise, and, and Belichick still couldn't you know, concede that. So uh, I think the respect and the money would have gone a long way, but no, now that he's in Tampa, he might play till he's 60. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, there was a falling out with Belichick for sure. And I think that's the main reason he left. I think he would have been a lifelong Patriot if mm -hmm. he just got respect and he got the contract that he deserved at the end there. I mean, if it was me and I'm the Patriots, I'm not letting this guy go. I would have gave him a five year deal and, <laughs> whatever amount of money he wants, give him a blank this, check. I mean, at this point, he also, yeah, no. Plus at this point, he also obviously already knows his new team is legit. I mean, they're going to the Super Bowl in his yeah. first year with them. His yeah. receivers aren't going anywhere anytime soon. That defense is only going to get better. I mean, that's a young defense. It's going to only get better. Um, Brady won you know, and, and Belichick Kev lost. To Kevin's <laughs> point as well, about to Kevin's point as well about Stephon Diggs, that would have been ridiculous. I mean, Stephon Diggs, I believe, led the league in receiving this year, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yep. It, you know, so hey, you saw him out there looking at Kansas City celebrating. So maybe he wants out of Buffalo. Right. He's like, hey, I want to join one of these Super Bowl contenders. <laughs> but believe it or not, we are out of time. Quick moving uh, show. And we'll certainly have you guys back and uh, talk some more about Tom Brady, the legacy, and of course, uh, how bad Bill Belichick looks <laughs> for letting him go. Because Brady going to his 10th Super Bowl, pretty unbelievable. But for Jared Keene, Kevin Stone, Andy Barron, Mike DeRoge, and I'm Tom Nappy. Thanks for watching H Camp Sports Talk. Take care and be well.